Uh, so as he said, I'm a machine learning engineer at TELUS, but I just graduated uh, in February from my PhD uh, at the University of Alberta. And uh, the, what I'm going to present today is a part of my PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, the paper that, that uh, resulted out of this study uh, is also uh, shown on the bottom of the screen. So uh, in case any of you find this interesting, you can uh, have a look. Also, the co-author of the paper is my uh, former supervisor, Dr. Hamza Khazai, uh, who is an assistant professor at York University. And the study here uh, that I'm about to present here uh, was done at the PAX lab, Performant and Available Computing Systems at York University. So uh, the title of my talk is ML Proxy, which is an SLA error reverse proxy for machine learning inference on serverless computing platforms. That's a long title. So I'm gonna try and break it down one by one, the different pieces, and hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, this all makes sense to you, uh, what exactly is ML proxy and what it does. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna first have an introduction to different pieces of uh, the, the, what we need to understand to, to basically see what ML proxy does. Then I will talk about service computing as a whole and what it does for us ML practitioners. And then uh, we will talk about the design of ML proxy, what it does, and see the experimental results, and then we will conclude the talk. So uh, first up, introduction. And it stopped working. Okay, so machine learning in France. Uh, so you are probably familiar with this ML ops cycle picture. So this is basically uh, something that has been inspired by the DevOps cycle. And it comes from the fact that even for machine learning products, just like software products, we need an iterative process, we need an agile process, we need to do things. Uh, very quickly and we need to adapt to different changing conditions of our working environment. And going through this cycle, we start from the EDA phase to the, to the data prep phase to development training of a model. And what we see on the left side of this image is what normally formal education focuses on, coming for just from a PhD. What most of universities teach is what you see on the left side. But equally important is the piece that you see on the right side, which is reviewing the code that, you, that you've done. You don't want to make a mistake that, that's going to cost the company you work for a couple of million, millions of dollars. And then you want to deploy that. You want to put it in production, have it run some inferences, monitoring the, the results, and then going back to improving your process overall. So in this talk, what we're going to talk about focuses on the deployment and inference phase. So you have your machine learning model ready to go. You want to put it in production, and you want to do this as fast as possible, which is what service computing does for you. But you also want to do this as cost-effective as possible as well. So the next thing that we want to discuss is batching. So batching is this idea where instead of like running things in a Python loop, feeding them to a model one by one, we may want to do this, put all of them in an n-dimensional array, and then feed them all at once to, to this uh, model that we have created. And this somehow improves the performance. There are different aspects to it. There's the CPU or uh, cache rate that is in increased by this by doing this. You also use vector computations instead of uh, running a for, for loop on, on, your, on your inferences. And because of these different aspects, we will have better resource utilization, we will have better performance, we will have better performance to cost. But we also wanted to make sure that it has the same effect in smaller instances that are very common in service computing. So instances that have like one CPU, have 256 or 512 megs of RAM, do we still see an effect, uh, see the effect of batching there? So we tried out different models with different packaging libraries. 
with different machine learning libraries coming from different data sets with different levels of complexity. And what we did was we tried different batch sizes and we measured the response time on a serverless platform. And we plotted the relative response time here. So what this relative response time is, is how much does that inference for that batch size take compared to a batch size of one? So if you have, so in perfect conditions of linear baseline that we have there, if a batch size of one takes X amount of time, a batch size of 10 takes 10X amount of time. And we have, we, it, it, it scales perfectly linear. As you can see, different types of models react dif differently to batching. For some models, for more complicated models where we have like image recognition or classifications, the bigger models, we don't see a lot of benefits from batching requests together because the model is big enough to fill up the cache probably, cache of the CPU or many other things. But in cases where we have lower to mid complexity in your more classical machine learning models, you will see that batching makes a lot of difference because in those cases, the, running the Python for loop, the Python for loop itself is a big portion of the calculations. And so as you can see, different workloads have different responses to batching. So any methodology that we use to do batching in production needs to be adaptable to the kind of workload that is running under. Another way to look at this is by looking at relative time per inference. So if a batch size of 10 takes X amount of time, we can deduct that each of them probably took X over 10 amount of time. And looking at this, we can also see the benefits more clearly. For a couple of workloads, we see a 20% benefit where we have a slightly less overhead per inference. For one of them, it, it gets even worse, so we don't want to do batching there. But for places where batching makes sense, where batching gives us some benefits, that is the portion that we want to focus on with, with uh, ML proxy. And as we move on to using more hardware acceleration in ML machine learning workloads, as it is more available on service computing platforms and Kubernetes, platform, uh, Kubernetes engines and everything, we will see this effect to be more and more prevalent. So the next piece of the puzzle is service computing. So over the last decade or so, starting from 2009, 2010, we have gone through different stages, uh, different paradigms in cloud computing. We started with infrastructure as a service. We said, okay, let's put the hardware uh, and use it in the cloud, use it as a utility, use it in a pay-per-use level, but you're still responsible for OS upgrade, for security patches, for all of the uh, maintain, maintenance of that uh, software, basically. Then, we, as time went by, we went into container as a service, Kubernetes engines and everything. Then we started to use platform as a service uh, systems. And then all the way to function as a service, which is the runtime engine for service computing platforms. And as we went through different paradigms, we started to delegate more and more of the uh, runtime management overhead to the provider. So all of a sudden, when coming to function as a service or service computing platform, when your services are down, it's not you that is on the hook, it's the provider. And ideally, with consolidation of more and more resources into these providers, these providers can do better. And as we have delegated more and more of the management overhead to the provider, this, this gives us the time and energy to focus more on the business logic and the speed of development, which is what really matters to us. What's, what really is the competitive advantage for our business? So basically, service computing is a cloud-native deployment model. And in this deployment model, developers build and run applications on the cloud. They pay only for the resources that they actually use, not what was provisioned for them. So all of a sudden, if your application is getting zero requests per second, you are paying zero dollars. 
and it uses an event-driven execution model. You tie the execution of your code to an event. Whenever that, that event happens, your code gets executed. And using service computing platforms, runtime operation and management is completely delegated to the provider. You just provide the code. You just provide the code and the model, and the rest is up to them. So all of a sudden, overhead provisioning and scaling of resources is done by the provider. And in this paradigm, software is developed by writing functions, not applications. And these functions have well-defined interfaces and are deployed separately, so you don't have the crazy long build times anymore. This is the generic developer workflow for service computing platforms. You, as a developer, upload your code to the service platform. I got this image off of AWS website, but any service platform works like this. And then you set up some triggers to cause the execution of your code. Then whenever those triggers happen, your code gets executed. And it automatically scales it for you depending on how many events are being, or how many triggers are being generated. And you only pay for the compute time that your instances actually use. So th this is what developer uh, experience would, would be with service computing platforms. And now, this brings a lot of challenges for the serverless provider. One of the challenges is that these applications are launched only as needed. We don't have pre-provisioned server servers. So they will need to be able to spin up an instance very, very quickly. In less than 100 milliseconds, they should have an instance ready to go with your code on it. And these applications are triggered by events, and the provider doesn't necessarily know when these events are gonna come. So they should be able to react and react very fast. We talked about how good the hiding of resources is for the developers. But at the same time, it creates a lot of challenges for the provider. The platform needs to deliver on different things like performance, security isolation, DDoS resistance, availability. And many things like the platform, the performance power efficiency or uh, the adoption of serverless depends on how well the management layer of service computing works. And the big, big challenge that they have to face is that when you as a developer are deploying your code to the cloud, you know what kind of resources it needs. You know what's in there. So you know how to handle different aspects of it. But when the serverless provider is trying to do that for you, these applications appear as black boxes for them. And so the way they set up their platform is try to make it as generic as possible. Make it work for the generic serverless work workload. But the thing is, machine learning inference is not your generic serverless workload. These applications are very, very different from, uh, from different developments, different web applications that you typically see. Machine learning workloads are very resource intensive. We do a lot of computation only for, to, to respond to one request. We do a lot of matrix calculation that can benefit a lot from vectorization. And we can benefit a lot from parallel execution. So one of the big differentiators between different serverless computing platforms is how they handle auto scaling, which can also be one way to integrate batching into these platforms. So you have your classical scale per request auto scaling in service computing platforms, which are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions. And the way that these platforms work is that when a new request comes in, if they have an idle instance with the same code, they will just forward the request to that idle instance. If they don't, they will spin up a new one. And then if an instance doesn't get any requests for like 10 minutes, or more recently, 15 minutes on, on Lambda, they will destroy, they will uh, remove that pod, remove, remove that instance, and release the resources that it has been using. But we also have a newer version of auto scaling service computing platforms that is designed to allow multiple requests to enter an instance. Because in a scale per request, you can only have one request per instance at the same time. So you can't have any kind of batching. 
So in metric-based auto-scaling, which for which the examples are Google Cloud Run and Knative, which is the open source version of the Google Cloud Run, we have a metric which is typically concurrency value or the number of requests per second that, that the, an instance is receiving. And the way that platform handles all the scaling is by changing the number of instances to accommodate for that number of target concurrency value that you want. So if you want your concurrency value to be close to three, meaning you want three concurrent requests to be, to be going to an instance at the same time, you will set it to three and it will change the number of instances trying to accommodate for that. And the third version is the classical resource-based auto-scaling, which, which is CPU-based or memory-based settings that you can set, uh, basically using the auto-scaling features of Kubernetes. So you set your CPU target utilization to 80%, and then the instances will the, the number of instances will change to accommodate for that. And to clarify, when we talk about concurrency value, this is what we say. Uh, basically, this is concurrency value is the number of concurrent requests that are that the pro, that the instance is working on at the same time. So when you create an instance, concurrency value is zero. And then a new request comes in, concurrency value goes to one. Let's say another request comes in, concurrency value goes to two. Then you respond to the first one, goes back to one, and so on and so forth. And the effect that concurrency value does for you, ideally, is to reduce the number of instances that you need to reduce your cloud bill. Because all of a sudden, if you have four requests, you can forward three of them to one instance and reduce the number of instances that are created for you. And ideally, if it doesn't take as much to work on those three instances, you'll be able to save on your cloud bill. But the issue here is that we tried this methodology for machine learning and it didn't work. And the reason was that the way these platforms were set up is yes, they allow multiple requests to go in, but they are still queued at the target. The instance still works on them one by one. So three requests takes three times as long. And so this doesn't save you money because you're, you have less number of instances, but you're running them for a longer period of time. And it is not quite the batching that we talked about. And this brings us to the motivation for ML proxy. So the motivation is that serving machine learning inference on the cloud is still one of the key challenges when we talk about productionizing machine learning. And previous studies have shown that service computing has very poor performance to cost ratio for machine learning workloads. We also know that batching has been proven to be necessary to improve our resource utilization, to reduce our bill. And it is not currently supported by the current generation of service computing platforms. But batching, especially for low to mid complexity models, can change, the, can reduce the processing overhead significantly. And as we have more and more hardware acceleration, we, we will see more of this effect. So what is ML proxy? ML proxy is designed to be something like an API gateway. So in your typical service computing platforms, you have an API gateway that sits in between requests that are coming in and the service platform itself. And the API gateway is, is responsible to translate those requests into API calls for the service platform. ML proxy is designed to be something very similar that can be later on added, be as an add-on to those API gateways or replace them. The way that it works is it re receives requests coming in from the clients. It batches them together. It allows for some time for requests to be queued up, then sends these batches to the upstream service computing platform 
receives the batch response and sends out individual responses. And while doing that, it also has a smart monitoring component that monitors different response times for different batch sizes. So that it can accommodate for, for the way that different workloads react to, to batching. This is a UML sequence diagram for ML proxy. So when the first request comes in, the ML, ML proxy talks to the smart monitor, gets the estimated latency for the upstream serverless competing platform, then calculates how long it can hold on to this request before it, it really needs to send this batch out. Then ideally, you would have more requests coming in. And this is before any timeouts happen. happen and you reach your deadlines. Then these requests are queued up. And then we have the timeout or queue full event or the time com coming in. And when that happens, ML Proxy sends the batch to the upstream service computing platform. And it records the SRT, which is the serverless response time here, along with the batch size. So that it can use that to adaptively estimate the response time of the plat platform for future requests. And you can set an absolute maximum batch size manually depending on your memory constraints. So for example, you may know that if I give more than 10 requests to this instance, it's going to crash. So that's your absolute maximum. And the timeout is automatically calculated to make sure that the deadline is reached for the oldest request. And the deadline is set by the, pro, by the developer. You set your 95th percentile deadline, and the platform, ML Proxy, tries to accommodate for it. This is what we call the high frequency queue scheduler algorithm. But the idea is really simple. Just when the first request comes in, start a timer. Then for each request coming in, estimate how long that batch is going to take and how much longer you can wait for new requests to come in. And then when you run out of time or your batch size is full, send the batch to the platform. And in doing so, it estimates the upstream serverless platform response time adaptively. So as you know, public cloud is not known for its consistency over time. During the nights or weekends, usually your, your code runs faster. And it automatically adjusts to that. Running in parallel to that, we have a low frequency dynamic batch optimizer, which is inspired by the TCP congestion protocol. And what it does is just run an additive increase, multiplicative decrease on the batch size. So if all is well, SLO is a smooth, my, I don't have too many timeouts, increase the batch size by some incremental amount. If there are too many timeouts or the response time surpasses the SL threshold that you set, the service level objective, the 95th percentile that you set, then decrease the batch size while multiplying by something like 0 0.8. So this brings us to our experimental validation. We ran our experiments in an academic OpenStack cloud on a Kubernetes cluster. And we ran this on an academic cloud because the government of Alberta provided to us for free. The use of our resources were 27 virtual CPUs, more than 100 gigs of RAM. We used some of the most well-known machine learning libraries. And all of the code for this is open source, all of the experiments, everything. So you can look at it for yourself. For the service platform, we use Knative installation as our sample service computing platform. And as you know, Google Cloud Run is a managed Knative. So it runs the same code. But the methodology here can be applied to all different service computing platforms, because all of them 
have the same lack of support for batching. We define our service level objective as the 95th percentile of response time over a period of one minute. And we found this to be a more preferred way of expressing the client needs. Because most of us care about the tail latency. That's what changes the client's satisfaction level a lot. And when we say anywhere SLO miss rate or SLO miss, we mean that in that window, the 95th percentile of the response time has gone beyond our set threshold. And everything that I just said is adjustable and configurable in the code. We used three different real-world patterns. And basically, what these patterns are are the number of requests per second that we apply to the system over time. And all of these were done over two-hour periods. So this is the results of a sample experiment. So we applied the shape you see on the top right to the platform. And, and when looking at the 95th percentile of response time, the blue line represents the result when we have ML proxy, and the orange line represents the result when we don't have ML proxy. As you can see initially, with lighter loads, ML proxy is increasing the response time. And the reason is that with lighter loads, your queues, your batches are not filling up. You're sending one or two requests at a time to the upstream service platform, but you are waiting for some time to trying to queue requests together. So because of that, we're adding to the end-to-end -end latency. But at the same time, we make sure that the 95th percentile doesn't go beyond the threshold. But when the lo load increases, we all of a sudden see the benefits of batching requests together. Since now we are doing batching them batching, we can get away with less resources. On the right, you see the number of containers. The blue line is when we have ML proxy, and the orange one is when we don't. And as you can see, when the load gets goes higher, the 95th percentile goes beyond the threshold that we set. We will see red alerts in our dashboards. And at the same time, we are paying more for those resources. But with batching, since we are better making better use of our resources, we can have better 95th percentile while at the same time paying less. And to do that, we need to batch requests together. And the average batch size on the right shows that effect to you. So as I said, initially, since the load is light, we, we see the timeout happening too often. And the average batch size is very small. And we don't get a lot of, a lot of benefits from batching requests together. But as the load increases, we see more and more, more benefits. The figure you see on the left is the complementary cumulative distribution function. But what it basically shows you is what portion of the request, what percentage of the requests, were responded to in more than this amount of time that you see on the bottom. So 100% of requests were responded to more than 10 milliseconds later. And as you can see, ML proxy increases the response time for a lot of these requests. But where it matters is where you have the red dashed line, is where, where you set your SLO threshold to be. You want your 95th percentile to be less than that amount. And you will see that around that area, ML proxy does a better job. 
it has less SL of miss rate. And we tried this for different workloads with different traces, different SLO thresholds. And these results are all in the paper in case you want to go deeper. So in conclusion, different studies show that the current generation of service computing platforms have very poor performance to cost ratio. They are not cost effective. You will see blogs that talk about how they reduce their $27,000 per month bill to $200 just by switching from AWS Lambda to, the, to Kubernetes engines. We also know that batching is shown to be an effective mechanism to improve the cost effectiveness of our deployments for machine learning workloads. And as we have more and more hardware acceleration, this effect is exacerbated. We will see it happen more often. ML Proxy is designed as a publicly available and open source tool that you can use to provide instance performance cost improvement while making sure the SLA is not violated. It doesn't require the knowledge to set the batch sizes. And even if you have the knowledge to set the batch size, every time that you redeploy your model, you update it, you will have to also update your batch size to make sure it doesn't violate your SLA. It infers the serverless response time adaptively. You don't need to specify it. And as we know, over time, the performance changes. This system will adapt to it. And it's designed with serverless mindset, with minimum knowledge required, and the least amount of work needed from the developer's perspective. ML Proxy can reduce the SLO miss rate while at the same time reducing your bill. In the studies that we did, ML Proxy was able to reduce the number of containers between 32 to 92% while at the same time reducing the SLA miss rate, the SLO miss rate. And in all of these, it used less than 200 megs of RAM and 10% of one virtual CPU. And this was implemented in JavaScript. So if it is implemented in C++ or Go, it can probably perform better. And it does all of this by sacrificing a bit of average response time and by improving resource utilization. Thank you. Service can only do one instance. In that case, do you still see um, some benefit to, to batch proxy or ML proxy, or is it just only uh, when the service is able to do multiple requests at the same time? Thank you, that's a great question, and that's one of the limitations of the work. So the thing is, Every benefit that the ML proxy brings is by using batching. So if batching has no effect, or if it doesn't help, ML proxy can do nothing for that workload. So the focus here is on workloads where, ML, where batching actually reduces the overhead, reduces the relative response time per inference, and then hopefully in those, ML proxy can deliver these results. Thank you. Just one uh, follow-up question. Um, you, you described the ML proxy um, algorithms and all that. Uh, if, if a practitioner wants to use it um, right away, where, where does one start? Is there a sort of package? Where does it get deployed? So the Docker container is publicly available. You can also see the code in this repository. OK. The second one. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. So in one of the results tables, uh, it listed the sort of SLOs for um, the different types of models. And your SLOs, yeah, they're kind of in the range between like 200 to 1,000 milliseconds. And obviously with like a lower SLO, you need a higher like number of queries to have the batches actually be worth it. Uh, do you see some kind of va some value to batching when you have like sub 50 millisecond SLOs and say your batch size ends up being, in general, like two or three or lower, or? 
Thank you. That's a really good question. So it really depends. There is there's no generic answer. But if your SLO is 50 milliseconds and your model takes like 45 milliseconds, then there is not much that you can do. Okay. So the most amount of cost savings from using ML proxy comes from the fact where we have more headroom, where the miss rate, where the SLO threshold is set to a higher number than what, to a much higher number compared to one request, or you can at least fit like a batch size of three, four, or five in there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.